from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Nicholas Brown, and I'm a music specialist here in the music division and one of the producers of the library's concert series. Uh, we're so pleased to have you here tonight for a lecture by Gene Snyder on Harry T. Burley. And uh, Gene, of course, has recently published a book on uh, Mr. Burley, and we'll be getting into all kinds of uh, wonderful information about his music and his impact, which has been immense on American music. Uh, just a bit about this evening and our concert series. Uh, the lecture will be about an hour. There will be a Q&A period. Uh, for the Q&A, we ask that you wait for a microphone to be brought to you after you've raised your hand, because we are filming the event for uh, our digital collections. The uh, video will go out on the library's website, loc.gov, and also on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash library of Congress. Feel free to subscribe to video and email alerts on any of those platforms to, to get all kinds of wonderful content from events that perhaps you weren't able to attend. Uh, Following the conclusion of the talk, there will be an opportunity to purchase copies of Gene's book, which are available over there courtesy of the library's shop. They are at a discounted price of $28, uh, which is really exciting, so thank the library for that. And uh, Gene will be signing books uh, at, at the table just over there at the conclusion. Uh, this event is being presented as part of the library's African American History Month celebrations. Uh, you can visit our uh, online portal for African American History Month, which is AfricanAmericanHistoryMonth.gov. It is a partnership between the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and the National Archives, as well as other uh, entities within the federal government. And uh, just a word about our collections and Harry T. Burley in the collections. Uh, we have a huge amount of his music. A lot of it came to us through copyright deposit. And uh, if you visit our website, loc.gov, in the top search box, you can type in his name, and you'll get all kinds of wonderful resources. Some of those resources um, are under copyright, so you might only be able to pull them up in full high resolution on site here at the library. Um, but definitely check those out. There's some great resources and a lot of wonderful articles written in conjunction with some of the sheet music on there. And if you are working with our collections at a distance, you can um, contact our reference librarians anytime, uh, lsc.gov, and then in the top menu, click down on the menu and you'll get an Ask a Librarian option. So if you need to, for example, get a scan of something for a paper or uh, you want to frame a picture of Mr. Burley, you are totally welcome to connect with our staff to figure that out. A uh, couple other exciting events coming up. Uh, we have uh, one of our Library of Congress jazz scholars uh, appearing for the first time this season on March 1st, and that is Ingrid Monson, who is a distinguished uh, jazz scholar, and she's an acting dean up at Harvard right now. Uh, and then uh, coming up later in the spring, we have a bunch of wonderful other uh, string quartet performances, uh, jazz saxophonist Steve Coleman is uh, has been commissioned by the library and will be premiering a new piece of his in April. And then uh, Ambrose Ekemuzire, who's a wonderful trumpeter, will be performing in May on the 20th. And he is a recipient of the Thelonious Monk Award and Prize, which is a big deal. So he's going to be really great to hear. And uh, stay tuned to our websites for some really cool event announcements coming up. Uh, the two places to check are loc.gov slash concerts. You can also visit our Facebook page, Library of Congress Performing Arts. If you just type in Library of Congress, you'll find us on there. Um, all of our programs are free, and they are made possible by private contributions to the library. So if you're interested in learning more about our Friends of Music program, you can visit our website again, or visit loc.gov slash philanthropy to learn more about making tax-deductible contributions. Uh, because without you, there would be none of this types of programming here, so we appreciate your investment in um, the community and making these events possible. Without further ado, we'll welcome up Dr. Snyder, and she will introduce herself. Thank you very much, Nick. He's been great to work with in uh, planning this event. Good evening. I'm honored to be here with you to tell the story of Harry T. Burley, distinguished baritone, art song composer, music editor, and pioneer arranger of spirituals. I'm especially grateful to have been invited to speak at the Library of Congress, where I spent many hours on numerous occasions exploring the treasury of the music division's resources of sheet music, music journals, recordings, collections of personal papers of composers, 
and being guided by the wisdom of librarians like the legendary but now retired Wayne Shirley. Labor libraries are my favorite places and this library is the best of all. Now before I go further, I need to introduce a couple of very special guests. Burley's great-grandson, Harry T. Burley III, is with us. And let me also introduce Duan Rees, who is the Music and Performing Arts Curator at the New Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. And Harry's sister, Marie, is on her way, but stuck in traffic, so when she comes, I'll be sure to acknowledge her, too. <clears throat> exactly 100 years ago, in the 1916-1917 concert season, Harry T. Burley's art song arrangements of spirituals literally hit the charts. Critics in New York and Boston reported that Burley's arrangement of Deep River was the song most often performed in, concert, in recitals that season. In addition to advertisements by his publisher in Musical America that listed singers who were performing it, the cover of one 1917 edition of Deep River featured the names of 21 famous singers who were singing it. President Woodrow Wilson's daughter Margaret sang it. Composer Dudley Buck's voice student sang it. African-American tenors Roland Hayes and Sidney Woodward sang it. Deep River was one of 14 Burley spiritual arrangements published that season, bringing the powerful songs created by African-Americans during the dark days of slavery to the concert stage and to choir lofts around the country and far beyond our American shores. Today, 100 years later, we are still singing Harry T. Burley's solo and choral arrangements of spirituals. You can check, you can check them on YouTube, and you can also check his ever-expanding discography. You'll find one on my website, harrytburley.com. Who was Harry T. Burley and why are the spirituals important? First of all, as I'm sure you know, Harry T. Burley was born 150 years ago in Erie, Pennsylvania on December 2nd, 1866. We've just been celebrating his sesquicentennial. He was a third generation free man whose grandfather had been a slave in Somerset County, Maryland. And with his grandfather, Hamilton Waters, begins what we know of the story of Harry T. Burley. It is a quintessentially American story, one that can tell us and our children more about who we are and who we can be. What was it that prepared Harry T. Burley to move with such distinction, first as a baritone soloist in his hometown, much in demand, then at age 25 to study at the National Conservatory of Music in New York City, and as a singer throughout the Eastern Seaboard and as far west as Minneapolis. Then nationally and internationally as a composer of art songs, uh, songs written for a trained singer, usually accompanied, secular songs, usually accompanied by piano. And finally, sorry, as a highly respected music editor at the New York office of the Ricordi Music Company, and finally as a pioneering arranger and singer of and esteemed lecturer on the spirituals, a vast repertoire of music that has generated many of America's most vibrant music traditions. What was it that equipped Burley to move far beyond his African American community in Erie? First of all, there is no question that it was his family who nurtured him, who supported him in moving toward the fulfillment of his impossible dreams, who demonstrated a determined love for education and a staunch moral integrity as well as a love for music. They endowed him by inheritance with rare musical gifts. More specifically, his grandfather, Hamilton Waters, who purchased his freedom for $50 and his mother's freedom for five in 1832. His mother, Elizabeth Waters Burley Elmendorf, who graduated from Avery College in Pittsburgh in 1855. Burley credited her with keeping him focused on his highest goals. His Aunt Louisa Waters, who paid for his first piano lessons, and in whom he confided when, as a teenager, he suffered taunts and bullying from his classmates. His father, Henry Thacker Burley, a Union Navy veteran who in 1871 
was the first African American to serve on a jury in Erie County. His stepfather, John Edgar Elmendorf, also a veteran of the Union Navy, who modeled for him an active involvement in public life, including directly challenging the Republican establishment that betrayed its promises to the man who had delivered Erie's black vote in the election of 1888. Burley's grandfather, Hamilton Waters, was said to have an exceptionally melodious voice. And here you see him with two-year-old Harry and four-year-old Reginald. This is about 1869. He shared with Harry and his brother Reginald the precious heritage of the songs and stories created by the slaves. In later years, Burley often referred to his grandfather, and as his father died when he was only six years old, it is likely that his grandfather and his stepfather influenced him more profoundly. Much more could be said about Burley's family, but let's move to the musical soundscape that shaped Burley's early life. He commented that the first music he ever heard was the rumble of trains and the songs of stevedores. It was a short walk from his home on Third Street to the docks at the north end of State Street and the train tracks that, that ran along the bayfront. Long before Burley worked as a pantry man on the lake steamers, he heard the singing of dock workers and stevedores, many of whom were from the south. Did he hear jubilees or spirituals as well as <clears throat> on the docks as well as from his grandfather and his mother? Perhaps this is where he first heard the roustabout song, Oh Rock Me Julie, which he arranged for publication in 1914. Burley said, I don't recall when I first started singing. It seems I've been doing so since infancy. The whole family was very musical, and they often had family concerts in their home. The first newspaper accounts of Burley's singing were as part of a family quartet. He described his mother as a natural singer and credited her as his first music teacher. He learned spirituals from her as well as from his grandfather. In his mother, Burley saw a love for art music combined with an appreciation of, his, of black music at a time when many educated African Americans wanted to forget those reminders of slavery. Burley's lifelong commitment to church music and to an Episcopal mode of worship was nurtured at the Episcopal Cathedral of St. Paul, where he and his family were taken in as members just a few years after the Civil War. Burley attended St. Paul's on Sunday mornings with his mother. The congregation was known for its fine singing, and he was a charter member of the St. Paul Men and Boys Choir. You see him in the third row at the right. And you also see two young sopranos, African Americans, Charles Fisher and Charles, um, Charles Franklin. The congregation was known for its fine singing. I said that. A survey of the hymns, anthems, and liturgical responses chosen by the organist and choir director with whom Burley sang shows that his years at St. Paul's introduced him to composers of church music such as Palestrina, Tallis, Haydn, Beethoven, Faure, Stainer, and many others. Given the importance of Burley's role in preserving and promoting the spirituals, it is important to know when and where he heard and sang them in Erie. Erie's newspapers seldom recorded performances of spirituals by black citizens, though this may mean that they rarely sang them publicly rather than that they didn't sing them at all. The St. James AME Church was established in 1874, and though Burley and his mother attended St. Paul's, the family's social life centered at St. James. The early leaders of the African Methodist Episcopal or AME Church wanted their members to demonstrate their ability to move into more enlightened American culture, and they did not encourage the use of the songs, the cornfield ditties, as Bishop Payne called them, created by their unschooled ancestors. However, the folks at St. James did sing spirituals occasionally at fundraising events. Burley's grandfather was a lifelong member of the Himrod Mission, which offered instruction in reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as Bible instruction. One place we know Burley sang spirituals was in the choir at the Himrod Mission, where he led his blind grandfather on Sunday afternoons. 
Burley would have heard several of the groups of Jubilee singers that proliferated from the 1870s on. The success in the early 1870s of the Fisk Jubilee singers in raising money for their Nashville school inspired many imitators who raised money for their black schools in the South. Jubilee performances were announced in the Erie newspapers along with vaudeville, minstrel, popular theater, and opera troops coming to town. Black performers were not allowed to stay in local hotels, so black families provided hospitality. And it was common for traveling musicians to perform at a reception or gathering after the concert. Burley would have heard and no doubt met some of the finest black singers of his time before he left for New York City. When the New Orleans uh, University Jubilee Singers came to Erie in May of 1888, Burley joined the troupe, traveling with them until they returned to Erie in December. So Burley was familiar with the diverse repertoire presented by the touring Jubilee Singers, Jubilee songs, sacred songs, secular plantation songs, alongside ballads and parlor songs. Burley's fine voice was discovered in elementary school and in his late teens while he was attending high school when he was also taking business courses at Clark's, commercial, Clark's Business College, he was increasingly in demand for solos and ensembles at church and community events. We know Burley as a singer, but he gained proficiency on the guitar, the violin, the bass viol, and the timpani as well. A survey of the Erie Morning Dispatch and the Cleveland Gazette, a black newspaper founded in 1883, shows that by the time Burley left Erie in 1892, he was considered one of the finest classical singers in the city. In addition to singing in the Men and Boys Choir at St. Paul's, he was a paid soloist at Park Presbyterian Church, First Presbyterian Church, and the Hebrew Synagogue. By 1890, his solo repertoire had become quite sophisticated, including opera arias in addition to German leader and ballads and art songs by European and American composers. In September 1891, Burley again left Erie to join a Jubilee troupe. Frederick Loudon from Ravenna, Ohio, was now manager of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, who had just returned from a six-year tour abroad. Loudon recruited Burley who stopped in Cleveland to visit friends. But Burley's Erie fans didn't want to let him go. The pastor and congregation at the First Presbyterian Church sent a telegram urging him to decline the flattering offer to join the Fisk tour. They made their plea irresistible by raising his salary. Burley aborted his trip to Ravenna and returned to Erie. But only a few months later, the opportunity to audition at the National Conservatory of Music in New York City proved even more compelling and no offer from Erie Presbyterians could hold him back. <laughs> the National Conservatory of Music was founded by the indomitable Jeanette Thurber, and she needs her own biography. Trained at the Paris Conservatory where talented French musicians received the best music education regardless of their ability to pay, Thurber believed young American musicians deserved the same opportunity. American singers and composers should not have to travel to Europe to learn their craft. They should receive the best possible music education here, where they could find their own distinctively American voices. Burley was one of 200 applicants for four tuition scholarships for the artists course at the conservatory, which would prepare them for professional performing careers. And he was awarded one of the four scholarships. Burley quickly took his place as one of the best students at the conservatory. His music history teacher, Henry Theophilus Fink, music editor of the New York Evening Post, reported that Burley was the best student in music history he ever had. He had trained as a stenographer at the Clark Business College, and he copied his lectures down verbatim in shorthand. Thurber had gathered a stellar faculty, and Burley's accomplishments as a student paved the way for many opportunities throughout his career. For example, his counterpoint teacher, Max Spicker, was instrumental in his being hired in 1900 at the wealthy Temple Emmanuel, where he sang for 25 years. 
Even faculty members who didn't actually teach Burley, such as Oregon teacher Horatio Parker, remained his friends and supporters. Burley didn't study cello with Victor Herbert, but in 1914, Herbert invited him to be one of the founding members of ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. But of course, the most consequential connection Burley made at the conservatory was with Czech composer Antony Dvorak, who arrived in late September to be the director as Burley was beginning his second semester at the conservatory. Two faculty members published the erroneous report that Burley studied composition with Dvorak. As Burley later explained, he was not advanced enough to be Dvorak's compos in Dvorak's composition class. But when Dvorak heard him sing, he invited Burley to come to the apartment where he and his family lived to sing the plantation songs and spirituals he'd learned from his grandfather. Burley would sit down at the Steinway piano, loaned by William Steinway, whose store was nearby, and accompanying himself would sing the songs of the slaves, the music in which the composer was keenly interested. Dvorak listened intently and when struck by a distinctive note, he would jump up and stop Burley to, man to demand, is that really the way the slaves sang it? But Dvorak was interested not only in the distinctive characteristics of the music. Burley said he asked hundreds of questions about the lives of the slaves that created it. He urged Burley to give those melodies to the world. And this mandate would eventually become a primary mission for Burley. Burley was the music librarian of the Conservatory Orchestra, directed by Dvorak. And he often accompanied the composer on his jaunts through the city and to the shipyards and the railway yards, which Dvorak loved to visit. Beautiful pensmanship was stressed in his business training, and Burley's superb manuscript writing made him an invaluable assistant. He helped to copy the orchestral parts for the premiere of the New World Symphony performed in manuscript before it was published. And this is an example of his manuscript writing. This is a song that was dedicated to Sophie Braslaw. Um, here she is. <clears throat> I found that at the Boston Public Library. Dvorak believed in the intrinsic value of the music of ordinary Czech people. He had used traditional Bohemian songs and dances in his compositions. Now Dvorak was to fulfill Jeanette Thurber's intention that the conservatory would help American musicians find their American voice. As John C. Tibbetts observed in his 1998 essay, The Missing Title Page, Dvorak and the American National Song. Now this is a long quote. Dvorak's American adventure was fraught with significance and controversy. The most modest of men, he was himself a creature of contradictions. Born a Czech villager, a minority figure in a German-dominated musical establishment, Dvorak became a cosmopolitan artist, feted in all the musical capitals of Europe, Russia, and America. Many of his countrymen accused him of turning his back on his own roots. And conversely, the German musical establishment criticized him for his inordinate employment of folk idioms in his music. The truth is, he lived in both worlds, exploiting the idioms of his own culture in a vocabulary befitting the academic or classical style. He was precisely the right person to assume the leadership of the National Conservatory, end of quote. And we might add, precisely the right mentor for Harry T. Burley. Dvorak modeled a way to live in two worlds how to succeed in the world of Western European-influenced art music while introducing his own African-derived music heritage into that world. In W.E.B. Du Bois's memorable phrase, Burley would ever feel his two-ness. Even though in much of his career he worked within the white music establishment, Burley's goal was always to be a worthy representative of his race. Dvorak made music history in May of 1893, just after he'd finished composing his New World Symphony, by telling an interviewer that he found in the music of African Americans, quote, all that is needed for an American school of music, end quote. 
As you can imagine, Burley's comments were extremely controversial. But for Burley and other African American musicians, his words were electrifying. In August of 1894, several months after he had been hired as baritone soloist at St. George's Episcopal Church on Stuyvesant Square, where he sang for more than 50 years, Burley and Paul Bolin, another African American student, were appointed to teach a new cohort of black students who were admitted to the conservatory. Burley taught voice and solfege. By this time, as the Chicago Observer reported, Burley was well known in the best sets, read elite black communities, of New York City and Brooklyn, as well as Philadelphia, Washington, and other eastern cities. He was becoming known not only for his singing, but also for his compositions. Burley's first published composition was a simple Christmas song for junior choir, published in 1896 by St. George's. In 1898, his first set of three art songs was published. And so began Burley's little known but significant contribution to American music. His first art songs were published by G. Shermer. <clears throat> but in 1902, William Maxwell became Burley's primary publisher. By 1903, when German contralto Ernestine schumann Heinck made Mammy's Little Baby part of her repertoire, more singers were singing and recording Burley's songs. And I wanted you to see this uh, cover because Louise Alston Burley, who wrote the lyrics, was Burley's wife. I'd like you to hear tenor Richard Crooks sing Burley's 1904 setting of the wedding song, Oh Perfect Love. when William Maxwell's brother George became the New York representative of G. Ricordi and Company, based in Milan, Italy, Ricordi became Burley's publisher. George Maxwell also hired Burley as a music editor, thus securing him extraordinary access to publication of his music. For years, Burley's songs made up a significant section of the, mu uh, of the Ricordi uh, vocal catalog. He also facilitated publication of music by other black composers. Jester Hairston told me that he, went, that he and other younger composers would bring their music to the Ricordi office for Rick Burley's suggestions. Hairston said he always had time for us. One of the strongest supporters of Burley's work was A. Walter Kramer, the music reviewer of the journal Musical America. Kramer wrote overwhelmingly positive reviews of Burley's songs, though he proclaimed the gospel of high culture, calling Burley to ascend its heights by writing serious art songs rather than waste his talent in writing the love ballads that singers often used as encores. Burley continued to write some lighter ballad style songs, but many of his later songs reflected his conscious movement from ballads to the more serious art songs. In 1914, Burley's first song cycle, Saracen Songs, was published. This was an example of Burley's interest in what was called Orientalism, <clears throat> a set of seven songs with lyrics set in the Middle Eastern desert. The following year, Ricordi published five songs by Lawrence Hope and Passional, <clears throat> 
The Lawrence Hope songs were Burley's last Orientalist pieces. You see the requisite lotus blooms and the sari like, that's S A R I, dress of the young woman. <clears throat> Lawrence Hope was the pen name of Adela Florence Nicholson, who had grown up in India. These are considered to be among the best of Burley's art songs, and like many of his songs, they are written for lyric tenor. John McCormick performed at least 26 of Burley's art songs, including the five songs of Lawrence Hope. He often premiered them, and he recorded at least four of them. He also sang at least four of the spiritual arrangements. When McCormick premiered the Lawrence Hope songs for an overflow audience that included 600 people seated on the stage, he had to repeat the last song, Till I Wake. One reviewer called this the worthiest of the five songs. Let's hear tenor Roderick George sing Till I Wake.
Burley's third song cycle, Passionale, featured four poems by Burley's friend James Weldon Johnson. Each of these songs was dedicated to one of four tenors whom Burley knew would sing them, John McCormick, Evan Williams, Ben Davies, and George Hamlin. In June 1915, Musical America began featuring a column entitled, Some Compositions by Americans Who Are Worthy of Recognition. The first list included Burley's 193 song, Jean, and the Saracen songs. Following issues listed Ethiopia saluting the colors, He Sent Me You, Just You, and The Glory of the Day Was in Her Face, the last of the Passinal songs. In October 1915, Musical America featured 27 noted concert artists who listed their 10 favorite American songs. Six of these singers listed songs by Burley. Of the other 21 singers, at least 10 performed Burley's songs at various times. When Zabetta Brenska, a contralto who often performed with her husband, tenor Paul Althaus, was asked to name her favorite American song, she found it difficult to choose only one. But she said, if I had to narrow my choice down to one composer, I should select Harry Burley's songs. Most of Burley's more than 100 art songs did not announce his identity as an African American, though some were settings of verse by African American poets. They were songs about love, beauty, nature, universal themes that have occupied poets and composers for centuries. But Burley's penultimate published art song is definitely a black pride song. His setting of the Langston Hughes poem, Lovely, Dark, and Lonely One and I've given you the, uh, the lyrics on your handout. Burley wrote it with and Marian Anderson's voice in mind, but I don't know that she ever performed it publicly. Anderson's approach to the racial divide was to bridge it through her own very personal dignity and grace. But I believe it is a fitting culmination of Burley's art song catalog. Along with his setting of the John Oxenham hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West, based on a spiritual, the angels changed my name. Samuel Coleridge Taylor had, announced, had arranged this song for his 1905 piano collection, 24 Negro Melodies. The hymn in Christ There Is No East or West affirms Burley's lifelong hope that through their art, African Americans would help to heal America's deepest wounds. We need that healing now more than ever. I've given you the lyrics to both of these songs, but what of his spiritual arrangements? As early as 1901, Burley was recognized as a promoter of the intrinsic artistic worth of African American traditional music. In his recitals, he always performed at least one set of songs reflecting this music heritage. And as early as 1903, his own arrangements of spirituals. This was more than a decade before he began to publish the solo and choral arrangements for which we now know him today. I've given you a copy of a recital program from 1908 that illustrates this. In 1901, the chapbook Everybody's Magazine published three Burley settings of plantation verse written by Maria Howard Whedon. She published under the, under the name Howard Whedon. The editor's note accompanying each song shows that as early as 1901, nine years after he arrived in New York City, Burley was championing the artistic value of African American music. This is a quote. Mr. Burley, well known as a baritone at St. George's Church, New York, and as a composer, has long been working to show that the true Negro music is really worthy of serious attention and is by no means adequately represented by the cheap coon songs that have so much vogue." End of quote. From 1900 to 1915, Burley often accompanied Booker T. Washington on his tours through New England, raising money for Tuskegee Institute. Burley's singing opened the purse strings of wealthy donors. It was in these appearances that Burley developed his arrangements of spirituals. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have video recordings of these improvisatory performances so we could study the development of his style of arranging spirituals? Burley's reputation as one of the best American composers of art songs 
prepared for the immediate reception of the spiritual arrangements that were published in the 1916-1917 concert season. Many of the performers who were singing his art songs now greeted his spiritual arrangements with delight. Two singers played a significant role in bringing Burley's spiritual arrangements to the fore. The contralto soloist at Temple Emmanuel was Mary Jordan, a renowned recitalist and opera singer who performed a number of Burley's art songs, several of which he dedicated to her. Burley dedicated his arrangement of Deep River to Jordan and she sang and recorded it. Baritone Oscar Siegel, the son of a minister in Tennessee who had gone to the camp meetings with his father, had searched for appropriate arrangements of the songs he had learned to love. When he found Burley's arrangements, he immediately made them an important part of his repertoire. In May 1917, Siegel ended a recital in Brooklyn with a group of Burley's spiritual arrangements. Burley said he sang them like a black preacher preaches. And other singers followed Siegel's example by ending their programs with a group of spirituals. Now Burley's solo appearances shifted to lecture recitals on the spirituals. And in the late 1920s, as radio waves began to cover the country, Burley's voice was heard from the East to the Midwest and as far South as Texas, singing spirituals and speaking about their history and importance to American music. We need a doctoral dissertation to see if, when recordings first started to be made of those, of those radio programs. Let's listen to a high school choir the Central Islip Concert Choir from New York State, singing Burley's choral arrangement of My Lord, What a Morning.
you notice that is not, there is no accompaniment. Burley's choral arrangements were mostly meant to be sung a cappella, and they're not easy. So this is a, a really wonderful choir. The St. George's annual Vesper service of Negro spirituals, at, which began in 1924, drew overflow crowds. Sometimes the police needed to help. The newspapers announced the, them ahead of time and carried extensive reviews afterward. This is the program for the first of them. It was Burley's 30th anniversary at St. George's, and they featured uh, Burley as he appeared in 1894 and his 1924 photo. The programs always featured choral and solo arrangements by Burley and came to include arrangements by other composers such as Hall Johnson, Nathaniel Dett, Eva Jesse, John Work, and Florence Price. These annual services continued until 1955, six years after Burley died in 1949. It is impossible to overestimate the importance of the emergence of Burley's art song spiritual arrangements 100 years ago. Other composers, black and white, immediately followed with their own arrangements. And by 1925, James Weldon Johnson commented that the spirituals had a vogue. At first, Burley's arrangements were used more extensively by white than by black singers, but the enthusiastic reception <clears throat> of his arrangements was noted within the black community. The 1917 Spingarn Award acknowledged his contribution in bringing the spirituals to the attention of distinguished audiences nationwide and in Europe. The Honorary Master of Arts degree from Atlanta University in 1918 and the Honorary Doctor, Doctor of Music degree from Howard University in 1920 also recognized his role in helping African Americans reclaim spirituals as an artistic heritage, rescuing them from their association with minstrelsy and vaudeville, and making them accessible to singers and music lovers of every cultural background, and that was very important to Burley. In his prefaces to the two Books of American Negro Spirituals, published in 1925 and 1926, James Weldon Johnson went so far as to say that Burley's work had been the principal factor in reclaiming the spiritual as a universally valuable artistic expression. This process had helped African American artists develop a black aesthetic. The emergence of these artists, and I quote, zealous to be racial, or to put it better, to be true to themselves, to look for their artistic material within rather than without, got its first impulse from the new evaluation of the spiritual reached by the Negro himself. Almost suddenly, the realization broke upon the Negro that in the spirituals, the race had produced one of the finest examples of folk <coughs> art in the world. The result was a leaping pride coupled with a consciousness of innate racial talents and powers that gave rise to a new school of Negro artists." End of quote. The new vogue that the spirituals enjoyed crowned, in Johnson's words, a long and steady development in the recognition of their worth. This swelling interest and pride in the spirituals released new levels of creativity among black artists in the movement now known as the Harlem Renaissance, or as some of its leaders preferred to call it, the New Negro Renaissance. It extended far beyond Harlem. At the end of his life, Burley expressed regret that his many art songs had fallen out of use. But he took satisfaction in the continuing popularity of his spiritual arrangements. He had helped to ensure that what he called this great free fountain of pure melody would continue to flow. That the spirituals, with their message of hope for freedom and human familyhood, would continue to be sung. His work had helped in the image he often used to unlock the musical treasure of the spiritual. He had helped to coin that treasure in universal currency. He had, as Antonine Dvorak urged, helped to give those melodies to the world. Thank you. Uh, wondering if there are any extant uh, recordings of him singing. <laughs> That's a good question. 
Uh, Dr. Burley, Harry T. Burley II, would always tell people that there wasn't one. But when I asked him, I think he knew that I knew. And he sort of took a deep breath and said, well, there was one, but he didn't like it. It was, it was recorded in 1919. This is very early in recording technology. Now, as long as Dr. Burley was alive, I referred people to him. He's no longer with us, but someone has posted that recording on YouTube. And the problem for me is that I don't think that's the way Burley sound, sounded to his audiences. I think the technology was intimidating. And I don't think, he sounds stilted in that recording, and I don't think that's the way he sounded to his audiences. The reviews are glowing in, in uh, describing his engaging performance. So unfortunately, he would never agree to another recording. He did accompany um, Edward Boatner on another recording, and this was, these were made by the George W. Boom, Broom uh, Recording Company. Um, Broom, Broom was one of Burley's friends. Um, this was the earliest black recording company. Uh, there were recordings made at the 50th anniversary in 1946, but obviously Burley's voice was long past its prime by that time, and those uh, recordings were not made public. They were made available to people at St. George's, people who sang with him in the choir. I haven't seen those, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have a recording of how he really sounded. <laughs> yeah. so. Walk us through the history of the pronunciation of, of a lot of the words since Burley's, time, since Burley's time and into the modern world, because I know we've gone through periods of people you know, making it more white in terms of the pronunciation of of, of, of the language of this. Are you talking about use of dialect? Yes, dialect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Burley commented that the dialect softened the harshness of the Anglo-Saxon language. Some of his spiritual arrangements are written in what we call standard English. Some of them use dialect. He didn't think he he acknowledged that the dialect had been caricatured, but he didn't think that was a reason not to use it. Um, he was always concerned that spirituals be performed with dignity. And if you see any of his spiritual arrangements in their original uh, publication, there was always in the inside front cover a statement by Burley of how to perform the spirituals with dignity and respect. He didn't think that only black people could sing them. He, there was a, a, an interview of Burley and his son, Alston, in which they talked about the fact that some black, some black singers don't know how to sing spirituals and there are white people that sing them better. The important thing is the heart, the, the understanding, and, and presenting them with dignity. Is, does that, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for the comment on the Burley recording. I was gonna ask something about that. Um, Maybe maybe you said this. It is, it is of his arrangement of "Go Down Moses." Yes, that's the. I didn't say that. Thank th you. That's the right. the one he recorded. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, it's on it's on it's in a if if any of you want to get a CD of it, it, it can be purchased. Mm -hmm. It's on a two CD set called Lost Sounds, oh, that's issued true. issued by the yeah. Archeophone mm -hmm. label, and yes. that's how they got the upload to YouTube. Right. Um, yeah. I, my guess he sounds still that I think he wanted to be sure that that the primitive technology picked up all right. the pronunciation of the right. words, so he yeah. overdid it a bit. Yeah, yeah. But it, at least it's something. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. And that, of course, is, is uh, the recording that accompanies Lost Sounds the, uh, by Tim Brooks. It's, it's based on the book, yes. Yes, uh, and that's a history of recorded sound, Af African Americans. So I had, a, I had a few questions. I'll try sure. and do them quickly. Um, uh -huh. That, that 1893 interview with Dvorak you mentioned, all, he also referred to uh, what was Indian or Native American mm -hmm. music as being another possible source right. for an American right. national music. Um, that didn't go quite as far as African American, right. but I wondered if by chance Burley ever thought of that source. The reason I ask that is that, at least to my ears, the, the song Ethiopia Saluting the Colors sounds slightly Native American as well. You're not the first person that said that. Okay. Um, I, I worked through these songs with James Sample, who was a retired conductor, and he didn't like that song, Ethiopia Saluting the Colors, and he commented that that chord, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah those chords at the beginning, that was typical Indian music. Uh, 
But, um, yeah, Burley commented, he was interviewed in 1911 um, when there was a performance of the New World Symphony about his relationship with the Dvorak and his, and his influence, um, and the influence of African American music on Dvorak's writing. And he, he said, you know, there was a time when people understood uh, and, t and recognized that I had worked with Burley, with Dvorak, and had influenced him, but now people seem to have forgotten that. But he did comment in that interview, and I have, uh, it's in the book, uh, he did comment about Burley's, about Dvorak's interest in Native American music right. and the influence that that also had on the New World Symphony. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, are there any extant recordings or transcriptions of those radio talks he gave? That's what I don't know. I haven't right. had, somebody needs to find that out. <laughs> and, and did he ever get to meet Samuel Coleridge Taylor? Yes, he did. Okay. In fact, yeah, that's an interesting story. Uh, he, he met him in London, but he also, when Dvorak, when uh, Coleridge Taylor came to the United States in 1904, 1906, and 1910, he sang, um, and he traveled with, in fact, he arranged the tour in, 19, in uh, 1906, which came to Pittsburgh, as well as a number of other places. Um, yeah, they were good friends, and uh, there's interesting correspondence between them. And, in fact, Coleridge Taylor called Burley the greatest singer of my songs. Something that I just wanted to throw in um, yes. that goes along with the question about whether there were any recordings. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, my father, um, obviously had heard his grandfather sing, but he heard a lot of other people sing his work. And he said that Oral Moses sounded more like his grandfather than anyone else he'd ever heard. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get a better feel for what the mm -hmm. old man sounded like, um, f listen to some recordings that Dr. Oral Moses did. It's called Deep River, Songs and Spirituals by Harry T. Burton. You got it. Great. Yes, it's published now. It was uh, originally uh, issued by Northeastern Records, but it's been reissued by Albany Records, and it's easy to get. I beg your pardon? Oral Moses, O-R-A-L, Moses, a bass baritone from uh, Kennesaw College and University in Marietta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Thank you very much for playing that beautiful recording of um, My Lord, What a Morning. Yeah. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to participate in a performance of that same arrangement mm -hmm. uh, in a series of concerts last year in New York City, St. Bart's, uh, the Brooklyn Cathedral, a few others. Mm -hmm. uh, we also did the uh, Hall Johnson arrangement of When I Was Sinking Down. Yeah. And uh, you're right, it's very challenging with the acapella uh, <laughs> setting like that. But mm -hmm. uh, my colleague Diane Sayer uh, conducted it. And ironically, it was part of a concert which was uh, joined with the Mozart Requiem on the anniversary of September 11th oh. and it mm. was a huge audience mm. and it was a very emotional but it was amazing to see how starting with that setting captured mm -hmm. the audience mm. and in a in a colloquial in an English language mm -hmm. uh, beautiful classical piece of music that Burley did mm -hmm. and then brought them into yeah. this performance of Mozart's Requiem mm -hmm. so That's it was wonderful. an amazing experience um, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention that uh, my, as I said, um, this, this choir which performed that is going to be participating in a uh, performance in Carnegie Hall this coming June 29th, which is going to be a 100th birthday celebration of Mrs. Sylvia, Sylvia Olden Lee. Lee. And I'll be there. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and it's, it's, go, it's going to be joined, this is the Schiller Institute Choir, the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture, and the Harlem Opera Theater. That's wonderful. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. I think, going to include some of the performances mm -hmm. of Harry Burley's choral settings and also some of the solo settings of the spirituals. So thank you very That's much. That's great. For Thanks that. so much. Yes. Yeah. Sylvia Olden Lee, if you don't know, was a coach at the Metropolitan Opera. And she coached people like Kathleen Battle and lots of others. Um, very was, important person. Was definitely and Al Adolphus Hellstork has written a, a song called Who is Sylvia? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to say you can, you can also find a Mormon tab Tabernacle Choir recording of this song, but I love that high school choir singing. They, they do it so beautifully.
there time for one more, if anyone's got one? Yes. Louise, thank you. I just wondered about Louise Burley, because that's a fascinating part of the story. And it is a fascinating part of the story. Louise Alston Burley um, was considerably younger than Burley, but they met, they, they met, I'm not sure when they met, but Burley sang in DC. She was, she was uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, which is now part of, uh, of uh, Washington, DC. Um, I think when they married, he, he, they hoped to have a, a creative partnership. Um, but eventually, I think the stage wasn't big enough for both of them. And first, she, uh, she wrote a lot of dialect po poetry, which she was very successful in, um, in doing readings of her, of her poems. But the marriage they, they were separated, I think, in 1913. The marriage ended in 1915. And she had discovered another part of her heritage, which was Native American. And she left New York City with, um, with an, an Indian man named Albert. His last name is escaping me. She settled in um, the Dells in Washington, in, in Wisconsin, where she had a, a little cabin and she became Princess Nadonis Shawa. And she could get away with it because she, um, she, it, she was a very credible Indian princess. Um, but she couldn't allow anyone to know that her husband and her son were African Americans because she couldn't have owned property. And she couldn't have, she, she was very successful in Lyceum programs and Chautauquas. Um, but her life was very separate from, from her husband and her son. That caused problems at his death in, in claiming some of his estate. That's another story. It's told in the book. Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's, it's an American story. His, her audiences didn't understand enough about, African, about Native American culture to know that what she was presenting was her fiction. Uh, and she was a very fine performer. Uh, she wanted, she, she commented in a, in a letter to her son um, that she would have liked to be a vaudeville performer. So, you know, their, their ways diverged. Yeah. Great. Sorry. Yes, sure. His mother was a college graduate, right? Yes, yes, she graduated from Avery College in 1855. So how did that influence and inspire him to be able to go forward with oh, what he accomplished? No question. The, um, this was a, an abolitionist college, and it, it wasn't the first college for African Americans, but it was the, probably the first that had an African American faculty. And it was a classical education. She learned Greek and French and Latin. Wow. At her graduation, she gave, as the, news, as the Pittsburgh newspaper said, an essay in French, and her, um, she was very good at it. She also gave uh, a speech in which she adverted in terms of sorrow to the, m the many people of her race who were still enslaved. Um, she was a very well-educated woman, and the Erie papers picked up the, the, the Pittsburgh um, story and said, oh, she's, she's uh, qualified to teach in the best seminary in the land. But could she get a job teaching at the Erie Public Schools? No, she could get a job as janitor. But her two, two of her daughters became teachers in the Erie Public School in the 1890s. Burley's sister, Eva, was hired in 1890, and Burley's half-sister, um, Bessie, uh, Elmendorf Marshall taught music in the, in the school where his where her mother had been janitress. So, but she taught uh, for an, a number of years in the colored school, which was established partly by her by her father, Hamilton Waters. There were sometimes 300 students in that school, so she was very gifted, but frustrated. 
Oh, uh, now I don't know whether he, she, he knew her personally. He sang some of her songs. An interesting, uh, when Dvorak made that startling statement, someone interviewed uh, European composers and Boston composers, of whom Amy Beach was one. She was one of the boys. Um, and she said, well, I'm not an, a Native American or an African American. I'm um, from Scots-Irish ancestry. And she wrote her Celtic symphony as a, as a direct kind of reflection of, Ber of Dvorak's New World Symphony. It was in the same key. But she quoted and wrote in the style of Celtic folk songs. Um, it, I don't know. It would be really interesting to know if they ever met personally. I don't know that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you to Dr. Snyder for sharing her work with us. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.